So I've been looking at energy saving in the home for about the last 10 years or so because it's a sort of personal passion and hobby of mine and I've managed to turn it into my day job as well rather conveniently uh, by taking my work home with me and turning my house into a living laboratory uh, much to the annoyance of my family uh, to enable me to get an insight into energy monitoring, energy saving in the home and some of the psychology of behaviour change around that. So I'm going to take you through some of the, um, the progression from innovation in the home to uh, the village I live in uh, and some work we've done there in social housing and then to the regional level at Eco Island which is the, uh, the new name for the Isle of Wight which is where I live, uh, turning that into a sustainable island uh, over the next few years. So uh, come with me on a journey. So I've been monitoring how much power my house uses for about the uh, last seven or eight years uh, using firstly a, a, a one-of-a-kind Andy special monitoring system that sends a nice detailed graph to the internet of all the um, different appliances. I can identify the shower, the kettle, the, the, the washing machine from their unique signatures. Unfortunately, my family isn't quite as into these graphs as I am, so I've built this ambient device in the bottom right-hand corner, which is a glass sphere about so big, uh, with red, green and blue LEDs inside that can glow any colour of the rainbow. And that turns, it glows green or amber or red according to how much power the house is using. And I've found that even the, the least technically orientated people are attracted like moths to a flame uh, to this, uh, this indicator to find out what it's actually trying to tell them. And particularly when you go to bed and it's lighting up my study, if it's, glowing, if it's not glowing green, we hunt around the house trying to find things to turn off. Um, which can easily save you five pounds worth of electricity overnight, so it's, uh, it's, it's well worth doing that. So, not content with monitoring the whole house, and as Alan mentioned, being a, a bit of a, a master inventor at the same time, um, I wanted to drill down into the, the sub-metering level, as, as Kirsty mentioned, um, but this is um, slightly less sophisticated. We've got CT clamps over different parts of the wiring circuit, so I can tell different zones of the house uh, what they're using. Um, there are these little things called IAMs in the bottom left-hand corner, the individual appliance monitors, uh, which send how much power one particular plugged-in device is using. And then I've got some other sensors, like the, this light sensor here, which tells me when the lights are on in a particular room. I know how many watts they're contributing to the, uh, the whole house mix. And that led to an application called the Power Pi, where the whole house is the circle, and then I can pull out uh, different sectors of it to see how much those are contributing to the energy mix. This has been particularly useful to know where to focus my efforts and expenditure on going after the, uh, the biggest hitters and the low-hanging fruit. So if you look at the kitchen lights there, that's currently saying 8% of my total energy use is lighting the kitchen, these big halogen spotlights, um, which just take forever, you know, just take tons of power. So this data and the fact that they use 148 watts on average, which is about 150 quid a year of electricity to, to light my kitchen, allowed me to do the ROI calculation on LED lighting. Uh, which of course uses uh, a tenth of the power, but it cost, it cost about 25 quid a pop, so it's quite expensive, it's costing about 300 quid to replace all these bulbs, but the ROI was less than two years based on this data, and in fact they've now paid for themselves, so I'm uh, in the money from now on, so that's pretty cool. A lot of my colleagues and friends wanted to do the same thing as me, monitor their home energy use and reduce their uh, electricity usage, um, so rather than build their own, there are commercially available kits. Uh, this one's from Current Cost. I should mention other energy monitors are available. Um, but if you buy one, the reason I particularly like this one, there's a little socket on the bottom you can plug into and a, a stream of lovely data comes out in a nice XML format so you can parse the data and send it off to the internet and do the, do the nice graphing thing. Now, if you plug one of these monitors into a desktop computer, 24 by 7, to find out how much power you're using, the answer is about £120 a year in electricity more than it was before, so don't do that. Um, so we've fallen in love with these little low-powered embedded Linux devices that um, typically use about 10 watts of power, so only use about 10 quid's, a, quids worth of electricity a year. Um, I see there's some green PC on the stand over there, the, the Fit PCs. That's the same kind of thing, so a very low-energy embedded Linux device. That allows us to parse the data and send it off to the internet using IBM's Smarter Planet messaging system, which is called MQTT, Message Queuing Telemetry Transport. If you look at mqtt.org, you can find out more about it. So we, about 50 of my colleagues bought this kit, and we set up a, a, a sort of comparative website, and it's probably sad to say that a sort of geeky community has formed around these graphs of people going back day after day to compare themselves against their colleagues, a sort of peer pressure and friendly rivalry um, 
to see how, why some people's are so high and other people's are so low. And this we found um, if people have in-home displays, they tend to only be interested in them for about two to three months, and then the interest goes away and they return to the draw, the RTD uh, thing. So keeping a competitive interest up keeps people going back and keeping in the front of their mind their attention to energy saving and it has shown some big behavior changes so we've uh, we found that quite important and we did a project last year with some of our students um, we built a, a 3d immersive model of a street and we allowed people to have a sort of caricatured house in the street but your neighbor isn't your real neighbor it's your virtual neighbor in your sort of list of people you want to be compared with. So that might be your colleagues at work, it might be your top six friends on Facebook, it might be the guys you go down the pub with. You choose and they become your neighbours in this street and you can see there, second from the right, poor old Cathy, it's got a big red flashing house and it's the garden's all dead and the smoke is billowing out with skull and crossbones showing that she's really the energy pig. Um, amongst her friends, whereas uh, Lucy on the left-hand side is all sort of very virtuous and green and her garden's all growing nicely. And we were able to really go to town on making them feel real major peer pressure and uh, quite a lot of guilt as being the, uh, the, the energy pig in their street. Also monitoring water usage uh, through a far less sophisticated system than Gazprom can provide with little... Uh, uh, clip-on, uh, not tape-on uh, magnetic sensor, which counts the pulses as the litres go past, gets counted by the little um, embedded device and puts my water meter live on the internet. And also we do complex event processing to look at unusual water events. So it might be a small amount of water in a long time or a large amount of water in a short time, which might be a leak or a burst pipe or something, which then gets sent through to me as a me an SMS message, which allows me to uh, react to that in a timely way. All sorts of other sensors in the home, giving me a rich picture of data to do data analytics and data mining on, which of course is what IBM is interested in in this space. Um, if the windows are open, if somebody comes to the door, if there's sort of somebody in a room measuring some degree of occupancy to help me optimize the, uh, the control of the heating system. I can also control devices as well as monitoring things. I've linked up a system called X10, which does power line carrier controller devices in the home. So I can turn my pond fountain on and off or my... Uh, um, my heated towel rail in the bathroom comes on automatically in the morning. Um, so there's little things that make life uh, that much more luxurious, luxurious in an automated home. I can do a little demo for you here. So this is my, uh, my patio lights, switching over to the webcam image here. And I've got an application on my phone that publishes MQTT over 3G to an internet broker down to my house. And if I click the right button, the lights come on. Hey, how cool is that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I actually did a talk for TED uh, in Warwick um, a few months ago where I actually did this live with a webcam in front of 1,200 people, so it was uh, much scarier than this, which is uh, obviously, obviously fate. But um, suffice to say, I can turn my lights on and off from my phone. Uh, so I mentioned uh, a project uh, in, in my village. This is Chail Project. I live in uh, a village called Chail on the Isle of Wight. Um, so this is a project to help people in energy poverty in social housing units. Uh, this is a project with the um, Southern uh, Housing Group to retrofit buildings with air source heat pumps, solar panels, uh, insulation, uh, double glazing and stuff like that to see if people um, benefited from the free electricity from the solar panels. So if they actually did their washing and tumble drying during the day when the sun was shining rather than the evening, they'd get free electricity from the solar panels and it would reduce their bill. If they didn't, it wouldn't change it much. And they didn't put any monitoring into this system because they didn't quite know how to do it. So people get so you should go and talk to Andy Stanford Clark because he's got this smart home just around the corner. So I specified a kit of equipment that's been fitted into each of the houses. There's 40 houses being wired up at the moment to monitor whole house energy usage, solar panel generation, water usage, and six individual appliances that we choose at installation time to see what the biggest hitting ones are. That data gets sent over IBM's MQTT technology uh, to the uh, Smart Energy Cloud, where it's sent off uh, in two, two ways. One is to a big database, so that our colleagues at uh, the University of Surrey can do analysis on that to do the quantitative research to go alongside the qualitative research they're doing in their environmental psychology department. But also, we have a, um, a portal that the uh, residents can log on to or sit down with their green energy advisor, who's one of the guys from the estate who's been trained up. And this allows them to go through and see um, if they're using unusually large amounts of electricity and drive behaviour change. 
Anecdotally, we're seeing halving of, of electricity bills on the estate, and we're also seeing a couple of fringe benefits, one being a great reduction in um, vandalism on the estate, and the other one is there's no rent arrears on the estate either now. So it's gone from average rent arrears to no rent arrears. So this is being deemed a great success, and we're hoping to replicate this um, in other areas. Now, I mentioned Eco Island, so this is the Isle of Wight's ambitious project to become energy self-sufficient by 2020. Trump, um, ambitious plans to install uh, solar PV, wind in some limited form, because we don't like wind, uh, big wind turbines on the Isle of Wight, but little wind. Um, tidal generation, we have the strongest tidal forces, um, second, tidal, second, second strongest tidal forces anywhere in the UK, coming around the size of the Isle of Wight, so tidal research centre. We actually have a geothermal opportunity on the Isle of Wight because there's a little fault line going across the Solent which we could tap into two, two kilometres down to make some very hot water and hence some electricity. Energy from waste, uh, we've only got limited landfill on the Isle of Wight so it'd be great if we could turn that into methane and AD it and uh, turn it into uh, something useful like electricity and other um, byproducts. Hydrogen storage we're looking at with uh, colleagues from ITM Power in Sheffield. A lot of interest in electric vehicles particularly with short haul because you're never more than 12 miles, well, never more than 24 miles away from your house on the Isle of Wight. So we don't need in-street parking for um, charging furniture. We can just you can always get home to charge up. So that's quite a good opportunity. Grid storage, all of those things integrated as a smart grid. So all those different features I've just, just just talked about have to be monitored, managed, linked together. And that's where IBM's interest in the what we term smarter planet of being instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent comes in to link that all together holistically into a manageable smart grid, a virtual power plant where we can sell excess energy into the grid uh, to, 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 make, to make money through an energy services company. That's the Isle of Wight. Uh, lots of other activities as well, linking it into the community. So it's not just about energy generation. There's all sorts of things around uh, reduced carbon miles, education programs, um, uh, low carbon transport, vegetable plot growing to keep um, you know, reduce the carbon miles of food, trying to keep uh, the pounds on the island through a greenback card, all sorts of activities, all linked together and in the longer term funded through this energy services company. Very exciting project. I hope that's giving you a little taste of that. Thanks for listening.